and tales for dark nights. The following performance is a third round entry in the 2016 Evil Idol voice acting competition. And you, the listener, get to help decide who wins. If you'd like to hear more of this contestant, voting for them is simple and only takes a moment. Just click the thumbs up icon. Can't stand them? Then click the thumbs down icon instead and cast them into the digital nether realm from whence they came. You decide their fate. Good luck to all of our contestants. The Medicine Was Black and Did More Than Expected Written by Michael Marks Performed by Stuart Kerf For Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and the Evil Idol Competition It started two years ago with my cancer diagnosis. Stomach cancer. They caught it late and I and my willingness to ignore my stomach problems were to blame. The cancer had already started to spread and the prognosis was not good. My doctor gave me a year at best with chemotherapy. It was looking very much like I was a lost cause. That is, until I was accepted into the clinical trial for a new cancer drug. I hadn't applied and was instead contacted to see if I would like to participate. It was strange as usually you had to apply to these types of things and deal with a list of qualifications as long as your arm, as well as a very large number of people who are also attempting to get in. When facing death, everyone is looking for a way out. I said yes without question. The hospital it was being done at was actually local. They claimed that they had facilities for the trial set up all around the United States. They also told me that they had hand-picked participants themselves. I remember the first time I questioned how they had access to my private medical records. The nurse just smiled and said she wasn't at liberty to say. I should have known right then that something was wrong. Desperate times lead you to dismiss things you normally wouldn't. And this was the most desperate time of my life. I was given very little information about the drug I would be taking. I was told it was a pill and I would need to come to their offices twice a week for doses. It seemed a bit low to me, but again, this wasn't a situation where I was willing to question much. They told me side effects could include memory loss, fatigue and shortness of breath, as well as mood swings and nightmares. This sounded like a reasonable trade for a chance to survive and I started treatment. The pills themselves looked rather strange. They were liquid capsules that appeared to be filled with a black medicine of some kind. I took my first dose and prayed. Memory loss started the first week. I would black out for long periods of time. It seemed as if whole days would vanish without me recollecting what had happened to them. At times I was lucid, I felt heavy and lethargic. I could barely get out of bed. I remember my friend Teresa stopping by to take me to get my doses for the day and she begged me to stop the trial. She claimed that the entire time I had been sick she had never seen me look so awful and she had taken me to nearly every chemo session. I told her it was the last chance I had and that was the end of the conversation. No matter the cost I wanted to get better, even if it felt like the process was tearing my body apart. A month in I was a living wreck. I barely slept. At least it didn't feel as if I did. I, I may have slept whole days at time as far as I knew. The blackouts were more and more frequent. I started driving people away as they claimed I would fly into rages over nothing and crying fits at the drop of a hat. Teresa stuck by me for the longest time, even after some of the horrible things I said to her. She would try to calm me when I would freak out, tell me that she loved me and wanted me to be okay, tell me that she just wanted what was best for me. She kept urging me to quit the trial, saying it wasn't worth it. I said things to her I regret. I will always regret. 
I called her names. I never should have attacked her for trying to help me. It was around the time I threw a lamp at her that she stopped coming around. Stopped trying to help. I can still remember the last thing she said to me. I love you. I always have. I hope you get better. I really do. I just can't be around you anymore. I'm sorry. Then she left. I was alone. I had to start taking the bus to my appointments for the trial, as no one would spend time around me. It wouldn't matter. If I lived through it, I would apologise later. My mindset was anything but stable at that point. Two months into the trial, I was told my cancer was in complete remission. I remember the doctor showing me the x-rays from each week I had been there. You could watch the masses shrink so drastically over the eight weeks. It was amazing. I cried. I hugged the doctor. I called it a miracle. I will never forget that doctor's words to me. The doctor that never gave me his name, never smiled, and looked so painfully average I don't think I could describe him if I tried. It's no miracle, Mr. Sanderson. It's only science. He told me I would have to continue treatment a bit longer to ensure the cancer didn't return. I didn't care at all. I couldn't have been happier. In the span of two months, I'd gone from death's door to a new lease of life. At least, that's what I thought. As I was exiting the building, I was grabbed by two men in dark suits with close-cropped hair. They told me I had to come with them and this was part of the trial. They said it was an important next step. I didn't understand. And for the first time since the trial began, I asked questions that I wanted real answers to. Where are you taking me? Why didn't the doctor mention this? Who are you? The men dragged me from the front of the building into the alley. We were headed towards their car. My questions continued as if on repeat, but now they were being answered with the feeling of painful tension as I was tasered and thrown into the back seat. Every time I would attempt to sit up or move at all, I felt another quick jolt of electricity. After the fifth time, I blacked out. I woke up strapped to a hospital bed. An IV tube ran into my arm. In the bag I could see some kind of black liquid that had a similar consistency to blood. I looked around the room. It was lit by nothing more than a light that hung over my head, so it was difficult to make anything out. I tried to let my eyes adjust in hopes I could see someone, a nurse, a doctor or possibly other patients. I would have even settled for one of the dark-suited men at that point, though I likely would have refrained from asking them anything. The feeling of isolation was miserable. I did the only thing I could think to do in that moment. I struggled against my bonds and screamed. It took nearly 15 minutes of my wailing and shouting before a door that I had previously been unable to see opened and a doctor stepped through. At least, it seemed like a doctor at first. The person was little more than a silhouette, but I could clearly make out that they were wearing a long coat of some kind and appeared to be carrying a clipboard. I ceased my screams and once again began asking my questions. Where am I? What is going on here? You know this is kidnapping, right? What's your name? Would you just fucking tell me where I am and what's going on? He just stood in the shadows writing on his fucking clipboard. I could hear the scratch of the pen on the paper as he stepped forward into the dim light of the bulb above my head. My guts went cold and my screaming resumed. The man had no face. I don't mean it was burnt off or that I couldn't see his face. I mean he had no fucking face. Just smooth flesh stretched over the place where his features should have been. The faceless doctor produced a needle and approached me. I struggled against him, but one of his pale hands pushed my head down and I felt the prick of the needle entering my neck. Moments later, I was back asleep. When I woke, I struggled to open my eyelids. They were heavy from the drugs I had been given. The room slowly attempted to come into focus, but was hindered by nearly blinding light. 
I instinctively raised my hands to shield my eyes and realised I was no longer restrained. I could feel my own nudity under the harsh light. I've never felt more exposed or terrified in my life. Mr. Sanderson. A voice came over the PA system, its words loudly echoing around the room. Can you hear me, Mr. Sanderson? Who is that? I shouted out. What the fuck is going on? I tried to look around the room, but it was far too bright. Ah, good. You seem to be able to hear me just fine. No need to worry yourself, Mr. Sanderson. You are just in the final stage of our new drug trial. I recognized the voice as the doctor who had been giving me the doses of my medication since the start of the trial. Would you please get to your feet, Mr. Sanderson? Once you have, we can continue. My body felt weak and heavy. I remained on my knees. To To your feet, feet now! It was so loud I could hear feedback in the PA system. It also shifted tonally. It sounded almost as if two voices were speaking at the same time. The doctor's voice, as well as another, more high-pitched one. My legs started pushing my body up as if in response. No matter how badly I ached from moving... My body continued to rise till I was standing. It was as if I was being puppeted from within my own body. It was a horrible and excruciating feeling. Excellent. The doctor returned to speaking in his overly flat and clinical tone. He turned away from the microphone he was using, but I could still hear him. Simple commands achieve response. What's going on here? I shouted again. Just as the words left my lips, the harsh lights of the room went out and I found myself once again surrounded by cold darkness. After a few seconds of feeling sightless and alone, a spotlight came on about 15 feet in front of me. Mr. Sanderson, please walk to the light. There was the doctor's voice coming through in that strange tone again. I felt my legs begin to move me towards the light. I could see the pedestal there, with something placed on it. And as I stepped into the light, I realised what it was. A gun. Mr. Sanderson, please pick the weapon up off the pedestal. My arms reached out despite my mind's protest. I felt the weight of the revolver in my hand as I lifted it, its grip rough against my palm. Suddenly another light came on, only a few feet from me. In the light I could see a man, tied to a chair. His eyes were wide with fear, his mouth gagged, his hands bound behind his back. Mr. Sanderson, would you please kill the subject in front of you now? Without any hesitation, I raised my arm and squeezed the trigger. The echo of the gunfire around the room was deafening. I remember screaming the word no, or or at least felt as if I did. I, I didn't even have time to stop myself. I reacted instantly to the doctor's commands. I watched as the man's chest exploded in a crimson spray, his chair falling backwards from the force, leaving his legs sticking up in the air. He vanished from my sight as the light went out. Excellent work, Mr. Sanderson. The split had left the doctor's voice again. They were controlling my mind. I had something to do with the drug they had given me and that strange tone in the doctor's voice. I felt tears running down my cheek as I stood there naked and helpless. Subject shows clear cognitive protest commands, yet reacted quickly. Let's try something a little more difficult, shall we? I couldn't tell if he was speaking to me or someone in the room with him. Another light came on, and I froze in horror as I turned to look at it. Sitting there, tied to another chair, was my friend Teresa, the one who had taken me to all my chemo appointments. She had told me not to take this trial. She had been a friend to me long after a lot of the others had gone. Through all my mood swings and misery, the one whom I had already hurt, already given so much heartbreak. Mr. Sanderson, please fill the subject that has appeared in front of you. The split tone came over the PA again, and I tried to hold my body back from doing what it wanted to do. 
I watched as Teresa struggled against her bonds. Her eyes pleaded with me for help. She was confused and scared. My muscles were at war with my brain and the pain was overwhelming. No! This time I knew I shouted the words out loud. I fought the raising of my arm. I fought against the pulling of the trigger. But I lost. The gun thundered and I watched as half of my friend's face disappeared. The chair spinning a bit towards where the bullet struck her before the light went out. I dropped to my knees, crying. You're doing great, Mr. Sanderson. Almost done. The voice had returned to the doctor's flat tone. I heard a shuffling to my right and looked instinctively as the last light came on. Standing there, like some kind of horrid nightmare, was a little girl. She couldn't have been more than eight years old. Her hair and pigtails spilling down the shoulders of her pink dress. It was the picture of innocence. She wasn't even tied and gagged as the others had been, just standing there crying. No, no, no. My whole body ached and my arms felt like they weighed a ton when I tried to move them. It seemed that tears in my eyes and the pleas for this to end on my lips were the only things I had left that I could control. Mr. Sanderson, if you would, please. That strange split voice scraped along my brain like nails on a chalkboard. I did the best to put the gun to my own head, but I couldn't fight against the pull of my arm pointing it in the direction of the light. Kill the girl. I wasn't even able to close my eyes. I just watched in disgust at the movement of my own hands. I squeezed the trigger and screamed. I was forced to look at her body lying there until the light went off again. It was no more than a few seconds, but it felt like an eternity. The image of her crumpled body lying on the cold floor. One of her shoes had somehow come off from the force of the gunshot. I'll never forget it. The scene is etched into my brain. When the room went dark again, it felt as if control of my body had been returned to me. I quickly raised the gun to my own head and pulled the trigger. I cried harder and screamed louder when I realised they had only given me three bullets. Mr. Sanderson, you've done an excellent job today. I have to say that your trial has been a massive success. The doctor's voice had returned to normal and it strangely had more life in it than I'd ever heard before. A lot of the others went insane, or their physiology just couldn't handle the medicine. You know, you did extremely well. Our perfect candidate. You're monsters! What did you do to me? Why would you make me do this? Tears and rage mixed on my face as I altered between screaming and sobbing. Why? As I told you before, Mr. Sanderson, it's just science. Those were the last words I heard before I felt another pinch in my neck. I turned to look and briefly saw another one of the faceless doctors with a needle in its hands before my eyes got heavy and I collapsed. I expected to wake up chained to another bed or in some sort of hellish nightmare. Instead, I found myself in my own house, in my own bed. I can easily say, though, I wish I hadn't woken up at all. The next few months were constant paranoia, guilt, fear and depression. I was free of the cancer, but I still felt like I was dying. I kept expecting to see the faceless men in black suits appear to tase me and drag me off again, but they never showed up. I tried to kill myself about four months later. Right around the time Teresa's brother told me that the police were giving up the search, that they'd found no evidence of what had happened to her, and there was little chance that she would ever be found. I sat with him as he cried, filled with guilt and hatred for myself. I wanted to tell him, give him closure, make him hate me. Instead, I let him cry on my shoulder and let him tell me that his sister always cared so much about me that she would be so happy that I beat my cancer. That night, I swallowed a handful of sleeping pills and a bottle of vodka. I woke up in the emergency room. 
I was told I was brought in by a man who refused to leave his name and number. And that's when I realised they were still watching me. I was kept under suicide watch for a while, but released when they deemed me as mentally sound once again. <laughs> that was nothing more than a joke though. I was as far from mentally sound as I could get. I knew they were out there, watching me, waiting, and that it wasn't over yet. Then came yesterday. That day I had gone back to the doctors to check on some stomach issues and my suspicions about my condition had been confirmed. My cancer had come back aggressively. I wouldn't have long to live and I would go slow and painful. The worst part was I knew if I tried to kill myself, they would just intervene again. I know they are always watching. Then in a turn far worse than that, I came home to something that nearly tore me apart inside. A note was on my coffee table. Mr. Sanderson, sorry to hear about your backsliding health. We've started a new trial for you, as we wish nothing but the best for our most successful test subject. We look forward to seeing you again and helping you towards the speediest possible recovery. We have improved our formula since the last trial and this one should be much more effective. See you soon. Sitting next to the note were two small black pills and a glass of water. My first dose now being delivered to me. Those pills have been sitting next to me for hours. Sitting right there staring at me and mocking both my will to live and my desire to die. If you had asked me yesterday what I would have done in this situation, I would have told you without hesitation. Today though, today I am not so sure, so sure. Thank you for listening. If you haven't already, don't forget to cast your vote for this contestant via either a thumbs up or thumbs down vote. By doing so, You'll help us determine who will become the next permanent member of our voice acting team. At the close of voting on September 23rd, based on your votes, the top five contestants will progress to the fourth and final round to take place live on October 31st at our annual Halloween live stream event, based entirely on your votes. Thank you for voting and for helping to spread the word. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, I'm Steve Taylor, host of Chilling Tales, the podcast, encouraging you to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for 